Hello, I'm Rick. And one thing I enjoy about Star Trek is the thought and time given into explaining elements of their in-universe technology. Shocker, I know. <laughs> it's not the hard science fiction setting of shows and books like The Expanse or Revelation Space which delve into the real effects of space travel like time dilation when approaching light speed and so on, but nor is Star Trek following the realms of franchises like Star Wars, Warhammer and Destiny with their borderline magical approach to traversing the void. In many ways it sort of flits between these two genres, reaching into real world science to explore an idea or concept, but also hand waving away issues with realms such as subspace or undefined telepathy. Part of this is of course the fact that a lot of their concepts begin based in real theories, even ones that are unobtainable and outlandish, but exploring the real life inspirations and starting points for these is a topic on its own. Instead I want to look into the more storytelling and narrative reasons why we buy into them. Often Star Trek goes to great lengths to make even its outlandish inventions have a layer of believability to them, all in an effort to suspend the disbelief of the viewer. But how does it go about doing this with clearly fantastical concepts? I think the answer has two parts. The first is layering specifically around three layers of explanation to any given fictional technology to build out a foundation of how it all works. With most science fiction, if you delve deep enough into how something works, eventually you hit a point where you run out of explanations because the ultimate answer is, it's made up. Even if it is based on a real premise, we still encounter this problem, so creating layers creates buffers between that point and the audience. For example, warp drive. On the surface, it allows for ships to travel faster than the speed of light without experiencing time dilation effects and breaking the laws of understandable physics. When someone asks how, we hit the next layer down of explanations. Well, it works by creating a stable warp bubble around the ship. That bubble compresses space-time itself ahead of the vessel while expanding it again behind it. This lets the ship sail over that ripple, covering far more distance than should be possible, thereby going faster than light. Then you can ask how once more, and Star Trek lore provides an answer. Matter and antimatter collide and annihilate, releasing the tremendous energy required. This is harnessed in a warp core which supplies the power to the warp engines, often the warp coils, that act as a sort of magnet but for space-time itself, creating a warped bubble around the ship. With warp you can even ask how once more to get into the technobabble answers concerning the reaction chamber and function of how the ship works, but this is where the consistency begins to waver based on the interpretation and the current author of the Trek narrative. But for most people, peering deep into around three layers of explanation is enough for them to establish themselves in the believability of the universe that warp is present in. At no point in the explanation prior to this is there a wavering in answers or well just because being the only explanation. Now just because is still there, but the longer you can postpone that answer the more immersive the world becomes. Phasers are another example. Surface layer, they are a weapon that fires a beam at things with various settings and power. Layer 2, they do this by firing a beam of particles from an array that cycles up and fires at the target. Layer 3, these particles are Nadian particles, launched in a variable phase state that can affect the power and effect of the beam by disrupting atomic nuclei. Although layer 4 of what is a Nadian particle is when you start encountering issues because, well it's a made up energetic particle. But most people will stop asking when they get to that point because their curiosity is sated enough to buy into the fantasy. Transporters, replicators, artificial gravity, most of these systems have at least three layers of technobabble to them that sounds believable enough because the made up part is buried deep in the explanations. I mentioned two parts to my mind that add to the believability of the fictional universe. The second part is consistency. Once you have explained one aspect of your science fiction universe, it needs to remain consistent with future explanations of how that technology works. That does not 
mean you cannot think up other uses for the same thing? For example, the many similarities between transporter and replicator technology. But if you start claiming a replicator can act as a stand-in for a warp core, you're going to need to back it up with a reason that draws on the pre-established explanations you have made concerning both replicators and warp. For me, this is why I have such a hard time with the explanation behind the spore drive, because I believe it fails to live up to this theory. Layer 1 is fine, that the spore drive allows for near instantaneous travel between two points in space-time. Nice, okay then. Layer 2, how? Well, the spore drive taps into the mycelial web using spores which span throughout the galaxy, so you can navigate these strands to travel. Okay, layer 3, how? The ship jumps in, or, or spins into a subspace realm, and I think it's in the roots literally travelling? We don't have definitive answers, only more questions and speculation. This is not a video to complain about the spore drive, but it is an example for me as to when this falls short and becomes noticeable. Another example for me is often telepathy in Trek. Now, a lot of what is shown on screens is not subject to all this lore in a bland information dump because that makes for poor viewing, but is instead drip-fed to the audience over the course of the series and episodes that focus on aspects of that technology. Let's take subspace as an example. Originally, it was simply added to techno babble away the fact that communications are also limited to light speed without some science fiction technology to circumvent that. Ignoring quantum entanglement for a minute. As time went on, Star Trek The Next Generation began exploring the idea that subspace was in fact a more complex web of pocket dimensions and layers, like the layered depths of an ocean, or as LaForge puts it, a honeycomb. Then we start seeing subspace lifeforms that can dwell there, which is why by the time of Discovery, I have no problem accepting that there is a subspace pocket where galaxy-spanning fungal networks could exist. It continues to add to the pre-existing established universe. The same goes for warp travel. In the next generation, there was a behind-the-scenes accepted explanation for how warp would work, pretty much as described in my simplified provided explanation. And the viewer did not need to know all of these variables, but the characters in-universe would. So when you hear terms like warp bubble, subspace turbulence, and so on, they're said with context. This means that, as the story requires it, these things can be referenced and explored to the viewer, gluing them in on the information the characters have and immersing the viewer in the world. After the seventh or so episode dealing with a warp phenomena, the audience can hear things like the Omega Molecule destroys subspace and can understand that that's really bad. But that approach to world building is fantastic, but gradual. This is where official Apocrypha content comes in, adding the layers of explanation drawn from the behind-the-scenes knowledge pool that the in-universe characters also draw from. Galaxy-class technical manuals, the history of the Klingon Empire, sources of information like this can act as a shortcut to build those foundations that the living universe of Star Trek needs to stand on. But not everyone is going to read those, so they remain shortcuts only and the shows should continue to maintain a layered and concise basis for their in-universe technologies, drip-feeding the layers as required to create an immersive setting. In my opinion, this is why Star Trek's technology, for the most part, is so readily believable, despite how ludicrous some of it gets. A dispenser for marshmallows? What a load of tosh! I'm not even sure I managed to convey my point properly in this video, it's more of a discussion piece I wanted to put out there that has been on my mind ever since I started looking into the lore of science fiction things as a pseudo-job? Obsession? Condition? It's always satisfying to pick at an area of canon, in any franchise, peel away that layer, to find someone has already thought of that and provided an explanation that sounds reasonable. And why does that sound reasonable? Well, it's even more satisfying when someone has thought of that, too. It's fun to pull the Emerald Curtain aside, and instead of finding the man behind the screen, you find another fun thing to examine. That man is still there. It's all still smoke and mirrors, 
but it's buried deep enough that casual scrutiny is not going to find them, not straight away. So I guess the point of this video was more to simply ask you the question in the title. Why is Star Trek tech so believable? This is my answer, but I'm curious to see if anyone else feels similar or has a different reason for feeling immersed in these worlds. Or are you someone who can just watch something and does not need that level of detail to simply accept it? Hey, if you say the magic man can do anything with a snap of his fingers, alright, I'll take it. It's a fun time. Thanks for watching this breakdown on what I feel makes for a good and believable universe, despite how out there it can really be if you examine it. I'm Rick, and I'll see you next time for another video. Until then, thanks again, and goodbye.